Madam Chairperson, <coughs> Mr. Rahul Gandhi, Ambassador Garekham, Mr. Anthony, Dr. Karan Singh, and other distinguished guests. <coughs> First of all, I must thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity, this privilege, to pay my tribute to the memory of as Mrs. Sonia Gandhi has just pointed out, a remarkable man who was not only the architect of modern India, but who left his imprint on many aspects of Indian politics, Indian society, and so on. Madam Sonia Gandhi has outlined uh, the most important facets or aspects of his personality, I can do no more except to perhaps add a footnote or two to what she has already pointed out. What I want to do in this lecture is to capture uh, some of the rough and tumble of the early days uh, of our freedom movement, uh, the heat and dust or the prose, as Nehru called it, of attempting to translate that blueprint into reality. And finally, and perhaps crucially, Nehru's intellectual concerns <coughs> that were rooted, as Madam, Prime, Mad, Mad, Madam Chairperson has just pointed out, in his cosmopolitanism and an incredible openness to cross-cultural exchanges. I want to focus very briefly on the Charter of Free India uh, because that is something which uh, we have we tend to forget, uh, which uh, embodied which is embodied in the objective resolution, which <coughs> Nehru in fact placed before the Constituent Assembly. I believe it's a very crucial milestone in the evolution of Nehru's blueprint on India's future development. It was the core of what would later become the country's constitution, holding within it the seeds of all that we as a nation may uphold, social justice, secularism, federalism, and several others. For Nehru, the, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the objective resolution carried the core, the carried the, the weight of a 5,000-year-old civilization, but he also sought to trace its lineage to the American and French Revolution, and finally, and not unexpectedly at all, the Russian Revolution. And yet, the course he envisaged India would take was to be wholly indigenous and suited to its own conditions. Neither democracy nor socialism was mere first procedural matters for Nehru. His strategy was to radicalize the founding principles by swamping them with the content of democracy and socialism without really naming them as such. The resolution, ladies and gentlemen, is both a repository of the aspirations and dreams of millions as well as the instruments towards the realization of those dreams. It was meant as a message of intent of the new nation, a message which sadly we have forgotten today to its people, the members of the assembly and the world community. Already in this resolution, there were indications of the role India was to play in the world arena under Nehru, and I'm sure Ambassador Garekha is going to speak on that aspect. It was not always easy, though, to extricate the national concerns from the international ones in Nehru's writings and speeches and his pronouncements, for his vision was typically Jainist-faced, at once looking back at the centuries-old civilization and the modern future, and simultaneously cast inside 
and turned to the eternal world. I would like to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, of the fact that, <coughs> that free India emerged out of partition. And the movement for, for freedom was paralleled by a growing communalization of its polity. Thus, it was quite natural that quote-unquote secular, quote-unquote communal issues would engage those who were drawing up the roadmap to future. Addressing a convocation, <coughs> <coughs> no, sorry, barely four days after independence, Nehru addressed a nation still reeling under the partition bloodbath and mass exodus. This speech that he gave is remarkable for its simplicity and lucidity. The reader will be able, simply by reading it, to gauge the measure of his sorrow and bewilderment at the large-scale violence. But its purpose is not merely to communicate the scale of tragedy. <coughs> Thanks very much. It is also to reassure the public that anarchy will not be allowed a free run, that things will soon be under control, and that government will take care for those who had lost their properties and families. Finally, there is a call for restraint. Throughout, the tone remains personal, yet authoritative. Addressing a convocation of the Allahabad University in late 1947, he celebrated, he, he, he elaborated on the role a university ought to play in the life of a nation, especially one still recovering from horrific violence and chaos as India was in the aftermath of partition violence. He invested great hope in the new generation's ability to heal old wounds and dedicate itself to work for the fulfillment of the national objectives. The questions weighing on his mind are the same, India's partition and the urgency of ending communal discord. His address is not tinged with suspicion, but by a frank acknowledgement that the subject of Pakistan must be on the minds of his audience. He admits that he finds the idea of a theocratic state unsuited to the modern age and tentatively laid out for the first time the barest of details, a preliminary idea of a nation confederation. The kernel of the model of nation building that the Nehruvian state embarked upon which I believe is still valid. In other words, the nation's vision can be found in its broadcast to the nation on the 15th of August, 1947. He clearly laid out the challenges facing the newly independent <coughs> nation, internal strife, grinding poverty, low productivity, inflation, long entrenched interests, and so on. He then outlined the ways out of the dilemmas. Two of his prescriptions were particularly valid. A rapid change of the antiquated land tenure system and large-scale industrialization. By dams and hydroelectric plants, the temples of modern India were of course to become the hallmarks of the Nehruvian era. Regardless of the ecological wisdom of large dams, one cannot fail to be struck by the fact that this is an independent speech and already Nehru had his course very clearly laid out and his task neatly chalked out. His National Vision speech a few years later is of course more detailed, sketching out his plan, the five-year plan to be precise. And it is here in this speech the Nehru first attempted to familiarize the people with it because it affects each one of you, he said. Nehru was nothing if not an extraordinary communicator. He communicated not to entertain, amuse, or provoke, but to edify, enlist, and mobilize the masses into action. 
to join his project of nation building as partners and comrades. On the occasion of India becoming a republic, he urged citizens to work harder. Only hard work can produce wealth for us and rid us of our poverty. Many of the speeches that Nehru delivered in the 1950s are like dispatches from the field, dwelling on the shape government policies would adopt in the early years of free India. This gives a sense of the daily business of governance, which is also reflected in the volumes that are edited by the Nehru Memorial Fund, the letters to the chief ministers, and how the vision articulated in the early years was being realized on the ground or not. Nehru acknowledges that the prose may appeal less than poetry. We see him therefore engaging in debate with a variety of actors over the path his government is pursuing in the sphere of economic planning and development. To an industry and happy with the taxation regime of the government, he explains the character of state he is building a social rather than a police state. On the other side of the spectrum were the socialists and communists, whom Nehru castigated for their obsession with obstacle, obsolete technology and methods, despite an agreement with their program for overhauling the feudal land system. He had little patience with the agenda of nationalization of all existing industries, most of which he feared employed outdated technology. He favored instead the construction of new enterprises, the shining examples of which were the great river valley projects. One of the most lucid explanations of the mixed economy path the country was embarking upon under Nehru's leadership can be found in his address to the Indian chemical manufacturers. Reacting to the charge that this mixed economy was fettering the growth of industry, at Nehru, that Nehru must choose between the free enterprise embodied in the United States system or go to the Soviet nationalization way whole hog, Nehru said, this is a very hard choice indeed, and I do not see why I should be forced to make it. The no country, he argues, can afford to blindly apply an axiom or dogma without weighing its worth and suitability to its peculiar conditions. The need then is to be constantly sensitive to the specificities of a society. And thus, in proposing the socialistic pattern of society, we shall have our own socialism. Aware of the weight of its historical legacy, the proletarian struggles of Europe he appropriates the term and imparts, I believe, a new meaning to him. But in doing so, he feels the need to distinguish himself from the communists, the natural claimants to the legacy of socialism, whom he euphemistically refers to as adventurous. From the 1950s onwards, the national political imagination came to be seized by an intense mobilization around the language issue with a demand for the linguistic reorganization of states. Nehru was not particularly interested where the internal lines of states would be drawn. His prime concern was for linguistic minorities, especially in the light of the existence of bilingualism, even in clearly marked areas of great languages. Though he believed in the development of languages of the people, erecting boundaries on the basis of language seemed to him to be rather parochial. And we know the master stroke, which was the state's reorganization committee. Nehru's prescription was simple. If a little, he advocated the unfettered growth of all languages. His family firmly believed that the development of one language nurtures and sustains other languages. This was the moving principle behind the founding of Sahitya Academy, 
which would translate the works of one language into another and thus encourage many languages and literatures. Nehru, of course, spoke in the house with the authority of the founding president of the academy. With his implicit faith in the redemptive potential of modern industries and technological advances, Nehru's interest in matters of science may appeal natural. One may not be too surprised by the fact that he ensured his presence at the opening sessions of the Indian Science Congress for almost the entire period of his premiership. What is surely refreshing is his insistence upon the inseparability of ethics from science. Emptied of morality, science can be turned into a force of evil, he argued. In a world still trying to come to terms with the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Nehru called upon the congregation of scientists, both Indian and international, to allay the temper of peace, to alloy the temper of peace with that of science. Addressing a conference at the Indian Science Congress, he had Nehru arriving straight from the opening ceremony of the Hirakud Dam, and prior to that from the rains, ruins of the ancient Allah Nalanda University in Bihar, muses on the deeper philosophical questions of science relations with the values of truth, compassion, and tolerance. This speech traverses with ease between centuries Map mapping the continuities between the remote part of Buddha's time, the engineering feat of the Hirakut Dam, and the Science Congress. He emphasizes the worth of emulating the tolerance of the Buddha period. There is something uncanny about the way in which Nehru, a self-taught and amateur historian, preempts some of the methodological debates of historical writings. And I'm just about to conclude, I'm sorry. He makes a fervent plea for social history, for a greater research in the daily lives of ordinary men and women who lived in the past. Only this could clothe the, dr the dry bones with flesh and blood. His second appeal to the gathering of historians and archivists is to rescue history from the charmed circles of fellow historians to understand that history must be written not for specialists alone but for the general interested lay reader in a popular and accessible mode. Nehru's inclusive understanding of the concept of culture is reflected in the inaugural speech at the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, which Dr. Karan Singh heads. He warned against the chauvinism of cultural nationalism, as represented in the German word Kultur, which means cultural relations should not be defined by conquest and domination. No culture is pristine and untouched by the influence of others. A culture and civilization's advance can be measured by the degree of openness it exhibits towards the ideas of other cultures. Thus, he identified the Indian traditions as characterized primarily by the synthesis of a variety of streams, the Gita, Upanishads, teachings of Buddha, the rejuvenating Islamic trends, new ideas of liberalism and industrial technology that came in the wake of colonialism, and the ideas of socialism, Marxism, and social justice that India's encounter with the West engendered. For Nehru, material progress alone did not suffice. The quality and depth of a people was just as important. He feared that the modern technological life was corroding the life of the mind, stultifying creative imagination, and rendering the modern man and woman intellectually desolate. It is these last aesthetic sensibilities 
that museum and art galleries as storehouses of beautiful objects would revitalize. Madras Government Museum, but as, best, but as congealed history, he warned the organizers of the centenary celebrations of Madras Government Museums. Museums are not merely invent inventorized the oddities of our culture, but those artifacts and items that would help us in relating the past to the present. Only as living history would they appeal to the common man. Nehru, I have basically, uh, and this, these are my concluding remarks, I have basically tried to, to provide a, a very general survey of how Nehru uh, was the nation builder and institution builder, and that his remarkable erudition uh, in dealing with subjects ranging from domestic politics to the ethics of and morality of science from India's role in the world affairs to his thoughts on culture. Through it all, personally as a student of history, I'm struck by how aware and alive he was to the continuity between the past, the present, and his hopes and vision for the future. Hence the constant reference to the weight of the past, the greatness of the civilization he had inherited, not as a burden to be carried as a reference point for judging the moral worth and wisdom of his decision. Nehru may be a cosmopolitan par excellence, but deracinated he was not. He believed his cosmopolitanism to be a gift from Ashoka and the Buddhist period. While Ashoka is the paradigmic ruler for him, the Buddhist period is a veritable golden age, marked by unique internationalism, tolerance, compassion, and a vigorous openness to foreign influences and ideas. It is to Ashoka and the golden period that he constantly harks back, be it the adoption of the Ashok Chakra in the national flag or the policy of Panchil. In conclusion, Madam Chairperson, one cannot but be regaled by the literary quality of Nehru's words. They come across clear and honest. Now you hear him delighted, now solemn, now youthful and energetic, full of hope for his country, and now piqued at the delays in the fruition of his ideas. It is a voice that we shall gain much from by returning to him more often. Thank you. <laughs>